The viewpoints expressed on Night Fright are not necessarily those of the host, the staff, the sponsors, or the affiliate stations. Tonight's program may contain graphic themes or images. Viewer discretion is advised. There is a time for question. There is a time for answers. There is a time for challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Showtime. Welcome to the show. It's Brent Holland. Welcome one and all to Night Fright. Get the coffee going, get the tea going, get a beverage of your choice going, and we've got a great show for you tonight. We're going to be looking at a new book called 18 Wheels of Horror. Yeah, it's got everything to do with trucking and horror. So for those of you that are driving along the 401 right now, the busiest highway in North America, goes between Montreal and Toronto. 500,000 cars pass by our studio every day. Um, this is going to be one for you because I'm sure you're battling the 18-wheelers right now. If you're in an 18-wheeler, ease off that gas pedal ever so slightly. Settle back and relax because we've got a wonderful, wonderful series of horror tales for you to indulge yourself with. Now, our guests tonight, and I say that plurally because we have three of them. We're trying something new, folks. We're trying something new. Uh, Night Fright likes to press that envelope to the unknown. <laughs> We've got three guests. Three of them participated in that book called 18 Wheels of Horror. We've got Eric Miller, who is the editor of that trucking anthology, 18 Wheels of Horror, as well. Eric has... Uh, a book called Hell Comes to Hollywood. It's an anthology series. He's the screenwriter of the sci-fi channels Ice Spiders and Swamp Shark and wrote the screenplay for Dog Soldiers 2. He has worked on the in the movie industry for over 20 years. Also joining us is Del Howison. And Del is a multiple award-winning editor and author and co-owner of Dark Delicacies in Burbank, California. Also joining us, our third guest tonight, Hal Bodner, or Bodner, writes very funny gay horror fictions as well as an occasional paranormal romance or comic caper thriller novel. He lives in West Hollywood, California, and is married to a wonderful man, half his age, half your age, you lucky dog, you, who had no idea that Lisa Minnelli is Judy Garland's daughter. Really? We got to get to that when we get to, uh, to Hal, folks. Let's start off with Eric. Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you for having us on. Really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. Tell us a little bit about the synopsis of 18 Wheels of Horror. Well, it is trucking horror stories, uh, fictional, of course, and as opposed to um, uh, car crashes and things like that, of which there are a few. It's more ghosts, monsters, uh, psychotic killers, and all kinds of strange things. And yes, an ice storm, thanks to Mr. Bill Hallis, and threatening truckers, uh, trucks, and, and the people that live in and around them. Eric, can you tell us a little bit about your involvement with the book? Yes, sorry, I missed that. Uh, I was the editor. I had the idea for this book quite a number of years ago, and uh, finally... Uh, I got around on my very lazy pace of editing and publishing books to put it out, and I uh, had the idea years ago, like I, like I said, I just spent a lot of time in truck stops in my uh, day job, as it were, uh, working in the movie industry in various jobs, among them uh, transportation and running equipment across the country, and uh, as I meet more and more truckers and get to know more and more truckers, and there really just didn't seem to be a lot of dedicated trucking fiction out there, and the world itself seemed really ripe 
for uh, for drama and horror. So that was the genesis. Hey, why don't I get together and do this? And through many of the people I met, uh, such as Bell and Howell, through the Horror Writers Association and other writers as well, it finally all came together after uh, after a number of years. And also your friend and mine, Ray Garten, is involved with the project. Can you tell us a little bit about how he's involved? Well, Ray, uh, I call him the headliner, as it were. He wrote an amazing original story for this. Um, uh, that big thrill for me, because I grew up reading uh, Ray's stories. I think we all, uh, everybody in the world, uh, in my uh, in my era, uh, fell in love with uh, um, live girls at a certain point. And then, of course, his uh, kind of, uh, what do you call it, the best, I would say, next to Duel, the best trucking horror story of all, his, his novel, Lot Lizards. Um, so... Just getting to work with him, actually, I believe it was Howell who introduced me, and also another fellow writer, uh, Shane Bitterling, who's in the book as well. They both knew Ray, and uh, but Howell, Howell made the introduction, and I think I was uh, frankly shocked that a man of his caliber and writing skills said, yes, I'll be in your book. So uh, that was a great thrill, and the story's amazing, and it fits in perfectly. So just really thrilled to have him as well as the other writers. And folks, you can find that show in the archives of www.nightfrightshow.com. Just look for Ray Garten's show. I think it's called A Haunting in Connecticut. And um, it's a pretty revealing show because it talks about Ed, Ed and Lorraine Warren and how they kind of manufactured everything and told Ray to manufacture the book that accompanied that film as well. So let's go to Dell now. Dell, can you tell us a little bit about your involvement um, and how you became to be involved with this great book called 18 Wheels of Horror and a little bit about your story as well that's in the book? Well, I was lucky enough to meet uh, Eric through my store in uh, Burbank, California. Uh, pretty much meet most of my horror people. There, somebody shows up sooner or later. It's uh, kind of the clubhouse for horror. And uh, I had been writing short stories in other people's books for quite a while and had edited uh, a few of my own anthologies. And at that time, Eric was doing the book, Hell Comes to Hollywood 2, the first time we talked about me writing, and I did a story for him there. And then when the opportunity came to do this trucking story, uh, I jumped at it because the idea of books at the truck stops, because they don't necessarily want to sit in that cab and um, just listen to the radio or music or whatever it is. Occasionally, you know, there are those out there who read, uh, even though Eric does uh, put the books out in an audio version, which I think is a very cool idea. So I wrote a story for him, and mine, I believe, is the only one that has no supernatural in it whatsoever, and is actually uh, um, inspired by a real happening uh, in Indiana uh, in the wintertime uh, that was in the newspapers, and my mom alerted me to it, and I read the articles on it and thought, wow, this could be turned into a really cool story, so hopefully it turned into a really cool story, but it was really fun working with Eric a second time. Dell, can you tell us a little bit about that story that inspired your story in the book? Well, it was a um, guy who had to make a run in the dead of winter, and uh, the weather was just atrocious, and at one point, uh, the freeway... Uh, was closed down, and he was made to wait at a truck stop overnight, and uh, or a rest area, I believe it was. And at the time that he was waiting, uh, since it was going to be overnight, he just kept the engines rolling and slept in the cab. And the next morning, when he tried to move, he found that the truck had been frozen in, which happens, uh, and he had to go down and and uh, hit the brakes with the hammers and stuff on the wheels to loosen the brakes back up so the wheels would turn. And from that point on, a series of, um, you know, perfect storm. And uh, things started happening to him, and that's what the story was about. Eric, let's go back to you just for a second. Now, how did you approach Hal to come and be part of this book? Did he, Hal approach you? Did you approach him? Uh, no, I approached Hal. Um, he actually did a amazing story, actually Bram Stoker nominated story for Hell Comes to Hollywood 2, uh, the previous anthology. 
um, which was, again, amazing. And I, I had known, got to know Hal through the uh, Horror Writers Association and became very good friends. And he was mainly a novelist, which he'll be able to attest to, and at the time hadn't done a lot of short stories. And I was really, really impressed with his talent, his personality, and I just thought he could bring something to Hell Comes to Hollywood. And again, he knocked that out of the ballpark uh, by uh, any estimation. So when I was doing the trucker anthology, of course, when I think of truckers and truck stops, um, to many people, well, he would be the absolute last person in the world they would ever think uh, would come up with a story for this. Uh, but I knew that there was a story in him. Because at the end of the day, no matter what the uh, no matter what the setting for a story is or the background, it's all about people and characters and storytelling. And how has that in spades? And sure enough, he did it once more. He he, uh, he pulled something out that uh, was incredible. I'm anxious to speak with Hal now. Hal, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. I was wondering, Hal, if you could tell us a little... Oh, thank you. Thank you. I was wondering a little bit if you can tell us a little bit about your story and your involvement with this incredible book. Well, Eric um, Eric kind of uh, coerced me into doing the, the Hollywood one, um, and I had... Uh, I've been in the entertainment industry for God knows how many years, so that wasn't wasn't too difficult. And then when he came up with the trucker one, um, I remember distinctly saying to him, "I don't even think I've seen a truck in my life, let alone can write something about truckers." <laughs> and um, it's it's completely alien to my existence. Uh, I don't. I mean, I don't even drive anymore. And uh, so I uh, I wrote a piece about. Uh, a guy, uh, the, the, the story I wrote was uh, actually taken from the point of view of uh, somebody driving on a freeway in California. Um, and it's about a guy who's uh, pretty out there, pretty crazy. Um, people are after him. And uh, what I did is it's a double, triple blind fake out. Are they after him? No, they couldn't possibly be. Well, yes, they kind of are. No, they're not. Yes, they are, and everything kind of works out exactly opposite the way you think it's going to work out, and for entirely different reasons than and you think it works out. Where did you go for research? Me? I called Eric a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, remember, I, remember at one, I remember at one point I had written something, and and Eric got on the phone with me, and he said, Hal, you've never seen a truck, have you? And I said, well, I've sort of driven by them where they were parked. And he said, well, the, the inside of a truck doesn't work the way you think it is. Apparently, though, I, I pictured something kind of Willy Wonka-like with, with levers and, and gears. And he said, no, it's all buttons now. Um, so I had to go back and, and rewrite that. But uh he was an amazing resource because I, I, I think the only, the only person I know who drives a truck, uh, there are two people, is the president of HWA has a truck, um, and I think back in 1972 I met a lesbian who drove a truck. Other than that, nothing. Did either one of those characters that you had met driving a truck, did they enter into any of the characters that you made up for your short story? I sincerely hope not, because the characters in my short story are all pretty psychotic. Okay, fair enough. Now, when you're making up your characters, where do you go for that research? I mean, there's one research, uh, I, I imagine, you, you know, you've got to get all the buttons and everything correct inside the cab of a truck, uh, all the technical aspects. Then there's the other research, or your imagination is allowed to flourish and bring forward these wonderful three-dimensional characters. How do you achieve that? Well, I'm known in, in both horror and, to a lesser extent, romance. I'm a character-driven writer. Uh, everything I write, I mean, I, I'm fond of saying I, I couldn't plot my way out of the paper bag. Um, so I don't think I, I actually, I think it's, there's a certain amount of instinct and a certain amount of craft, but you, I find characters every day. That's the easy part for me, uh, is, is creating believable characters. Because you see, plus the fact, I live in West Hollywood, California. I mean, character is the city's middle name. People are nuts around here. And I think if you're just observant, um, you can kind of pick a lot of that stuff up. Plot. 
when Eric, I'm going to go to you now, Eric, when you're creating a plot, do you create the whole scenario first, uh, sketch it out, if you will, the complete scenario, and then fill it in afterwards? Or do you kind of work sequentially? Um, uh, well, actually, a combination of both for me. Um, my, my background, uh, even though I've been writing stories most of my life, most uh, for the last 20 years or so, uh, I've been a screenwriter in Hollywood, as you mentioned. So uh, I'm very detailed, what we call treatment-oriented, which is a giant outline for the story. And kind of the way my brain works is I'm the opposite of how. Is I have to know the plot, the structure. I, I've got to know the beginning, middle, and end. And when I, after I know that, I start filling in the details. And I usually do hang that on a great character, or hopefully a great character, uh, and that helps me flesh it out. But uh, when you say sequentially, I, I, I don't know how many other writers have this, but uh, even though I know how the story ends completely before I begin it, I can't jump ahead and write the last scene. I have to write in order, which you know, sometimes uh, derails me for very long periods of time while I'm trying to get one scene working. And the same thing happens in a short story for me when I'm writing that is, a, a, to me, a good short story, like any story, does have a beginning, middle, and an end. Um, even though some are kind of more experimental, uh, Hal's giving himself a little less credit than he should. He does definitely have plots in his stories, even if he is character-oriented. And even, and even Bell's story, of course, too. He's, uh, even though he took his from a news story, there's definitely a story in there, and there, the interweaving of it all, which he can tell you about himself, I'm sure. Um, so... I, get, I do get the plot in my head completely, and then I, I always say I build the house first, and then I decorate it. I build it in and fill it in, and, and that's a good question. Actually, I'm always fascinated by the writing process and how other writers do it and how they come up with it, and I think that's part of the fun of editing a book and writing a story in it as well, is getting to meet all these other people and finding out the processes and how they do it. And every now and then I, I change a little bit and learn something from somebody else, but not very often. Eric, in any story, there has to be a strong protagonist and a strong antagonist even if the antagonist is the weather as in how in Adele's case uh, you know the weather is certainly the antagonist I would suspect in that story when you're reading um, probably dozens and dozens of stories is that something you look for is a strong antagonist especially in paranormal absolutely because at the end of the day in this particular volume I mean we're making horror stories and Obviously, what makes a great horror story than the Freddy Krueger, the Frankenstein, uh, the werewolf, whatever it is. So um, the, in, in some ways, I think horror, in a, in a very strange way, lends itself to be more antagonist than protagonist, um, even though they're both obviously essential to a great story. So, so when I read that, yeah, it's like, what is the monster? Who's the monster? And a great monster can take, uh, can take even a, an average setting and elevate it and punch it through the roof. And... Uh, uh, whether it's, uh, as you say, whether it's the weather and Bill's story uh, and a frozen truck break or uh, a complete batshit insane psychotic nut job and Hal's story or, or any of the many other uh, works in this as well, that it, it's absolutely critical. In terms of the psychotic nut jobs, uh, from my own experience driving on the highway here, <laughs> I can vouch for that very easily. And yet, you know, I've come across truckers that have been the sweetest people to stop. I see them stopping all the time to help stranded drivers out on the side of the highway. So I, I guess you run the full gamut there. Dell, I'm going to come back to you. What are the inherent dangers of truck driving today? What are the, some of the stories that they come in, horror stories, that uh, some of the truckers have told you? Actually, I have not spent a lot of time talking with truckers themselves. I am a writer, and I am a writer of horror, but the interesting thing is most of my writing does not involve the paranormal. And uh, I write a lot more like Hal does in that I'm character-driven, and then the plot comes after the characters. I think my, the characters drive the plot. The difference was in this particular story for the trucking anthology, there was that news story of something that actually happened that inspired me. So there was a partial plot there. Obviously, I had to tweak it for, you know, to turn it into a horror story. But the actuality of the plot became the driving force first. And you are absolutely right in my story, the weather itself is a character, almost like Elgernon Blackwood used a lot of nature. Uh, uh, for his uh, horror stories in the early 1900s, this one is definitely man against nature. 
and it, it kind of put itself out there. But in 90% of the cases, I write everything character-driven first. And in answering your early question, I do not know the end of my short stories when I start writing them. And I found out in a novel that I just finished that I'm basically what you would call a clothesliner. Even in a, even in a, a novel itself, I know where the novel started, and I knew where the novel was ending, but uh, I didn't know what clothes I was going to be hanging on the line along the way. And surprisingly enough, like Hal said, my characters kind of dictated how the story got from point A to point B. You say man against nature, but there, there's a machine in the middle of all of this. How did you work the machine into becoming a character in its own right as well? Well, the, the machine itself became a character partway into the story with in cahoots with nature, I guess is the easiest way to say it. But it was merely a device um, for this um, tale of the person against nature. It actually would have been a sub-level character. It wasn't the main driving force. And I know there's stories in 18 Wheels of Horror that the truck itself was the main character. I merely used it as a device to tell the story I wanted to tell. Okay, fair enough. Now, to stay with the truck, uh, there must be a relationship between the truck driver and the truck. Usually there is uh, with anybody, even with a, a muscle car, uh, people that are out there right now listening uh, that are driving muscle cars or have a relationship working on their cars, things like that. I'm thinking most truck drivers, you know, they always name their, their trucks as well. Um, is it is it a intense relationship he has with the truck? Does he feel betrayed afterwards because the truck has let him down and now he's stranded at the beginning of the story? No, no, I don't think there's a betrayal at all about it i think that it actually the betrayal is from the weather not from the truck the truck is something the truck almost becomes a partner that the person has to fight with and occasionally cajole and get along with and uh, force and not force uh, ease so it's it's almost like dealing with another person or a partner in that respect but they're kind of as uh, two parts of a whole. They are, they, it's not like where, hey, the truck is called Betty and, you know, I've been driving her 15 years and blah, blah, blah. It's not anything like that. It, my story is a device. I don't, I don't know. In Hal's story and, and a lot of the other ones which Eric could tell you, I'm sure it's a different. Okay, I want to go over to Hal now. Hal, uh, when you're creating a story, and there's all these arcs and relationships going on. Uh, do you ever surprise yourself as you're going along? You think you're going to go in one direction. It's kind of the back of your head. And all of a sudden, you decide that the character is going to take on a different type of perspective of the whole thing. And you find yourself almost well, going in a 180? There's, one, there's only one flaw in the way you ask that question, which is that you presume that I decide that the character is going to go into its own a different thing, and it doesn't. Uh, a lot of times, I mean, our writers are fond of saying the character did it. I mean, if I wish I had that kind of control over my characters, I don't. Um, sometimes they do things that you just don't expect them to do. Now, obviously, I'm not as psychotic or delusional as some of the people I write, so I know that the critters and the people that I'm writing out on the page aren't really taking over my life and controlling it, although sometimes it feels that way. Um, but what happens is, so, but we, we, we speak about it as if they have a life of their own. And, and it happens all the time. And sometimes it works for a story, sometimes it works for what I'm trying to say, and sometimes it doesn't. And I learned many, many years ago that I have a choice. I can either fight with my characters, and it, it's a battle. Um, to try to get them to do what I want them to do, what I need them to do, or I can go back to the drawing board and change something, uh, either a, a, a circumstance or an environment or sometimes even a character trait or a relationship. And by changing it, I can start my characters behaving in the way I need or want them to behave. 
Okay. Does that make any sense, or does it, that sound like I should be psychotic? No, no, not at all. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> In the same token, have you ever scared yourself? Because these characters come out of you, and uh, this uh, it's a question I'm going to ask all three of you, and I want you to answer separately. I'll start with Hal, then we'll go to Eric, and then back to Dell. Have you guys ever created a character so diabolical, so evil, that it has frightened you to think that you could come up, your imagination could come up with such a, a character? Hal? Difficult question to answer. Um, I certainly frighten myself with how deep I can go with certain things. Um, so I said, wow, did that come out of me? But I don't write truly terrifying horror. Uh, not that some of the stuff I write isn't scary, but I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not the guy that's writing the real deep, keep you up at night kind of horror. So I haven't gotten there. I've made myself cry a couple of times. I've gotten myself emotionally, but I don't think I've ever, you know, scared myself to the point where I got to keep the light on. Okay, that answers that. And for you, Eric, how about yourself? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, I'm, you know, it's obviously we're horror people, so it's tough to scare ourselves. But um, I, I did create a character, and hopefully, the name Uncle Ed, uh, if I have ever finished my novel, will uh, will uh, brighten quite a few people. It's a character I created quite a few years ago and have tinkered around with for a long, long time. And uh, if, again, if I ever finish the novel, it, it'll I think a lot of people will be impressed with the character. It's a very unique, very evil, very maniacal on all levels, psychological and physical, and very deep. So. I'm I'm kind of shocked. I I don't personally go into while I while I watch and enjoy and read. Uh, I guess I want to say the word for torture porn is the the thing. There's there's some artists, filmmakers, and writers such as the great Jack Ketchum who can pull off some of the most um, uh, lovingly reprehensible uh, books and movies of all time and still do them in a uh, vaguely tasteful manner and have all of the gore and violence come out of story and characters and situation. I don't personally usually write those kind of things myself and this particular character uh doesn't uh on, on i guess on camera you would say it or on the page do those things but he's definitely done them and alluded to them and i was kind of shocked at how deep and uh how much that character resonated and, and basically how far that character went regarding uh the evil nasty things he's done to people for a very long time and how about yourself Dell? have you ever created a character that's so diabolical so evil that you've kind of frightened yourself that this thing could come out of you? Kind of in a roundabout way. Uh, I agree totally with Hal. I have made myself cry a couple of times writing. Um, and most of my horror writing tries to come out of the human experience as opposed to supernatural ways. Uh, and a lot of my stories end with the fact that you might, you can believe it was supernatural or you can believe here's, Another way it, it, it could have been caused, and it's up to you, the reader, to make that decision. But I did write one story that was called The Necrosis Factor, um, which was about a scientist trying to, uh, a research scientist trying to save her husband from a physical uh, problem he was having. And what actually scared me, or bothered me, I guess would be a better word, was the length that she would go to because of the amount of love she felt for this person, yet at the same time disregarding all the other humans because of what she had to do to help the person she loved the most. So I have bothered myself a few times, but like Eric says, we're all horror people, so it's pretty hard to scare us. You know, it's funny. I compose music for television and film, and I just finished a score um, with an old doctor who in it, uh, his name is uh, Colin Baker. And, uh, you know, sometimes when I'm writing a score and there's a horror scene in it, or a mystery scene or something along those lines, I scare the hell out of myself sometimes. I go a little bit further than I thought. <laughs> so that's why I always ask that question to fellow, to fellow creators. The JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first-person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com. You know, there's a lot of young listeners 
that are budding writers right now listening to this show because you've got three heavyweights on this particular show, folks, tonight that are all seasoned professionals, if you will, in their craft. Eric, I want to ask you, because you've written for television as well and screenplays, is there things when you're writing in a book that you would put in details, if you will, and leave those out in a screenplay because, you know, it's gonna, those details will be taken up by the camera? Well, screenwriting is its own beast. Um, I think the uh, thing to, to remember about that for anybody who's getting into the industry is when you're when you're writing a novel and a story, there's usually you and an editor and maybe some other uh, person down the line in between you and the audience. When you're writing a screenplay, as uh, I think Hal and Dell know very well themselves, is you're writing a blueprint for a, another medium. So the words that you write, while they have to capture the eye of an executive, a reader, and sell the product and put it across very clearly and very visually, it's also the hardest thing for every screenwriter is knowing uh, that your baby is going to be ripped apart before your very eyes and you get notes and changes, sometimes by uh, 5, 10, and I don't even want to know how many people have a say in the, the ultimate product that comes out. So it's, it's disconcerting. So you do put details in. Obviously, um, uh, there's one, um, I don't know if this answers your question exactly or not, but I do remember uh, one of the few screenwriting books that I ever read. Uh, maybe I should have written more, and I'd have that house in Malibu by now. But um, one of the best pieces of advice ever was, why is the word camera in your screenplay? You are not a director of photography. You do not tell the director of photography what to do. Camera is not a character. Get it out. So it's a it's a fine line between between creating this visual world and something that can be interpreted and turned into giant monsters, amazing effects, great characters, and not putting in too much to presume that you're doing somebody else's job for them. So it's again fine line. It's it's a hard craft to learn, to be honest. Well, I want to stay on this with you, Eric, because as I just mentioned, I'm a film composer and, and you know, I, I worked on Hollywood films and stuff like that. And I do a lot of work here in Canada as well for all the, uh, you know, CBC and all those guys. Uh, music is a big part of any production, <laughs> huge part. There's no music in a, in, a, in a book. How do you fill that gap? How do you fill the gap of not having music in a book? Is that the question? Yeah, or sound effects. You know, you could write in a sound effects, but you can't write in the music crescendos or swells, creepy music, you know? You could do that yeah. type of thing perhaps well, in the screenplay, but not I, in a book. Yeah, I think, yeah, to be honest, I think uh, that comes down to the skill of a writer, and I think this is where a good novelist and uh, what separates the uh, uh, separates the uh, the amateurs from the pros or the kind of good from the very good is your you are writing a novel, you're writing a short story, you are the producer, director, writer, actor, you are everything, you are in complete control, and the masterful writers do all that on the page and bring those peaks and valleys and crescendos and do all those jobs that 20, 30, or 100 people do in a movie. And that's why my first love, as much as I do love movies and I work in the industry, and uh, believe me, I've seen every movie of every genre, especially horror, my entire life, I am still a book guy. And I am still in awe of a writer that can take me with just words and one person's point of view and take me into another world completely and involve me. That, to me, is just true art. And that's why I love books and stories. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Hal, I want to come back to you now. When you're creating a characters, when you're creating your story, and you're creating a, a story for written form, for a book, there's always a partnership that goes on between the author and the reader because you want the reader to be engaged enough to use their own imagination to fill in certain blanks in their own way. You want that the reader connects the dots somewhat for themselves and that they create the environments for themselves. So for example, in your case, a psycho, um, you may leave out certain character, not characteristics, but costume um, descriptions and let the reader fill in those things by themselves. If you say he picks up a knife or something okay. along those effects. I, I think you give, I think there's a couple of things that you, when you're, when you're filling in the, when you're coloring in the picture for lack there of a better go. word. That's better. One yes. is, 
where do I need to take my reader? Because if I have a specific place that I want to take my reader to, I need to use enough words to get them there. Mm -hmm. Because, um, so first of all, I've got to know where I'm going, and I've got to use the words to get them where I need to take them to create the effects that I want to create. And the uh, uh, and this particular piece, because I'm uh, the, the narrator in this particular uh, piece is what we call an unreliable narrator. Um, in that you, you very quickly learn that you're not going to take everything he says as absolute gospel. Um, so on the one hand, I have to use enough words to take him where I need, take the reader where I need to go. On the other hand, um, you use your words to create certain, to, for, as tools. So, for example, you can describe for a reader the way somebody looks, which to me is kind of pointless, unless it's essential for the story. A lot of times, you have no idea what my characters look like. Um, sometimes you do, but most of the time you don't. But what you do instead is you use your words to create something about the character so that the reader understands who that character is. It may be something like um, the way they act uh, uh, um, uh, in a certain situation, or a, a weird kind of quirky trait that they have. And I think that you create those things, and they're not descriptions in the normal sense. I mean, there's, there's still a ton of room for the reader's imagination, but by the same token, you as the author are telling the reader something about the character that you wouldn't be able to tell them with just a physical description. This physical description is whatever the reader wants it to be. You leave that to their imagination. My goal as an author is to create the particular create trait or the particular kind of character that I need to create. No, I think that answers it perfectly, Hal. Thank you. I'm going to go to Dell now. Dell, when I'm composing a score, I use my instinct, I use my sense of aesthetics, if you will, to look at a scene and I say, okay, this, this is a certain type of music. And once I get the feeling that the music is connecting with the scene and it's doing what it's supposed to do, then I know I can move on to the next scene. When you're writing for your own stories, is there a lot of instinct and sense of aesthetics you use? And in specific, how do you know how soon to reveal certain aspects of the plot? Uh, do you always worry that you're revealing too much too soon or perhaps too little too late? Well, you are. Uh... Always, you know, I always say to my alpha readers who get to read my stuff first is don't let me look stupid because <laughs> sometimes you feel if you've been working on a piece for a long, long time that you're too close to the forest for the trees kind of deal. But since I don't know my plot, I discover it as I'm writing. Once in a while, I will go back maybe and move an item, um, but the mood and the tone of of the story are created at the time I'm writing it and what's revealed is created at the time I'm reading it because I want to be a surprise and I want to discover just like the reader's going to discover. Now I do tend to overwrite. I do tend to put everything on the page and then in one of my rewrite stages I go back and clean it up and take out the unnecessary stuff. But every piece of discovery that happens in my mind goes into my original draft. And then if I feel it's too much here or too little there, then, you know, it happens in the later stages. Because for me, writing is rewriting. Okay, that makes sense. So it's kind of like carving then in that sense. You're working from a, uh, a, to a negative, if you will. You have to take out the negative space. Would, would I be correct? Exactly. It's what it... What, what do they say to the sculpture? The sculpture, they, you know, the it, it's all right there. You just have to take away the pieces that don't belong. So. There you go. Yeah, I love that. That's perfect, Dell. We're going to have some fun now, Dell, and I'm going to ask Hal this question next. What was it like working with Eric Miller, <laughs> Ray? <laughs> uh, and Ray. I don't know. I, I, it, it, it's, well, it, it, it's terrifying now. Um, i got to tell you, I, That's a horse I'm a novelist. Uh, I'm horse. known as a novelist. Yeah, really, really. No, I'm known as a novelist, and I uh, I had done maybe two short stories in my life before I did the first one for 
Eric, and, and of course that was the one that was nominated for the Stoker. Uh, um, and I would not have gone back uh, to work with Eric had it not been an incredibly wonderful experience. He's a really good guy to work with. Um, he's not afraid to question what you've done as a writer, um, but he doesn't impose his own stuff on what you're doing. He lets you do what you want to do as an artist, as a creator, um, and what he does is he stands back, and then if something doesn't work or he doesn't shake, he doesn't barge in screaming, this doesn't work, change it. He first comes in and he goes, okay, what were you thinking here? What were you trying to do? And he kind of guides you. And it was great um, for me. Um, I, was, I was thrilled to work with them. I'd work with them again. Um, uh, because it was a new it was a new genre for me, and he was amazing. I wouldn't have be, I would have never written a other short story in my life had the experience not been as good as it was working with him. As far as for me working with Eric, I think Hal said the operative word. Eric tries to get into the mind of the writer, what they were trying to convey at the time they were writing, not just what they did convey. And he, when he talks to you about any notes or any feelings or anything that like that, he uses the word think. What were you thinking here? What were you trying to accomplish here? Is this what you wanted? Is this not what you wanted? Um, and he really puts it back in your court. There is nothing that you put in your story, unless I'm sure there's an egregious error somewhere, but there's nothing that you you put in that he says, I definitely need you to change this to this. He says, what were you thinking? And are you sure this is the way you want to say it? Did you actually mean blah, 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 whatever it is? And yeah, Eric gives you a lot of blah, 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 but that's okay. You know, he's he, as an editor, he's a writer's editor. And, and that really makes all the difference, as Hal said. Eric, what was it like working with Hal and Dell? Well, I have to say, uh, and this is to all the writers, too, uh, I come from a place of, uh, and this, this may, uh, uh, may be strange to some people, I don't have an English degree. Um, I don't come from this from a high literary background. I come to books from having been a reader and a writer uh, most of my entire life, uh, even going back to when I was a small kid. So I'm deeply respectful of the written word and of the writers, and if if you guys, uh, anybody knows anything about working in Hollywood, while well, it is a wonderful place and uh, some call it a dream factory, it can be brutal on writers at times. So a lot of the genesis of uh, doing these books was breaking away from my screenwriting career and getting back to the written word and getting back to writers and getting to know them personally and seeing, uh, removing, stripping over, stripping away the layer of, uh, if I can use a bad word, uh, BS, bullshit, uh, of, of a machine and getting back to the real writing. So... Um, so I'm coming from that standpoint of being a writer myself and having been, uh, uh, having, having had bad people give me notes and do terrible things. And I never wanted to be that guy. I want to be respectful of the story that's there. But at the same time, if I see something that's not, not to, like, Hey, like they say, what are you, what were you thinking here? Maybe I'm missing it, or maybe there might actually be an error. And to be completely honest, it's kind of intimidating. I'm going to send a note to Ray Garden. I'm going to send a note to Hal Bodner or Del Hallison. It's, uh, frankly, it's quite frightening because these guys are 10, 10 times better writers than I will ever be in my entire life. Uh, but at the same time, I can see if there might be a tiny error here or there. And thankfully, working with these guys, um, there was basically, hardly any uh, notes whatsoever because they're such consummate professionals. I think it, it literally came down to some basic lines here and there or a word here and there or, uh, you know, heaven forbid, a dreaded typo here and there. So, um, that, again, intimidating and exhilarating that when I do send a note that people like them actually go, oh, hey, yeah, that was a good idea. And, frankly, I'm also the kind of editor that uh, I say I suggest things. Uh, maybe try it like this. And if that writer feels that strongly about what he wrote, even if I might personally think it would be better in a different way, it's not my story. Like Hal said, I'm not putting my, myself in there. It's their story. And I said my piece, and if you want it that way, that's the way it's going in the book. I have to tell you quite honestly, folks, that when I present my music to the director or the producers, I always give them a glass of scotch first. It tends to uh, always come in my favor. Let me put it that way. Now I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. 
I want to come back to Eric in just a second with another question, but I want to tell everybody who we're speaking with. We're speaking with Del Howison. We're speaking with Hal Botcher and Eric Miller. They have all come together and contributed to a wonderful anthology, horror anthology, called 18 Wheels of Horror. Easiest way to get it, folks, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on tonight's guest's book cover, 18 Wheels of Horror. That's going to take you right to a spot where you can order it from the comfort of your own home. Just a quick uh, question, Eric. Um, uh, there was mention that it's going to be out also via audiobook. Is that uh, also available at the moment? It's not available yet. Uh, my uh, audiobook uh, narrator had some uh, voice issues, and so we're delayed a little bit on the audiobook, so I have to apologize to everybody. But I'm looking, uh, hopefully, hopefully, definitely in time for Christmas, hint, hint. Yes. Uh, hoping within the next month we'll have the audiobook. And, and I do want to give a big shout-out to him as well, because I'm fascinated. A uh, young gentleman that I had actually met, uh, you mentioned H.P. Lovecraft earlier. I had initially met him at the H.P. Lovecraft film convention, uh, where he and a bunch of other wonderful actors do H.P. Uh, Lovecraft Live Radio Theater. I'm probably botching the exact name of it. Uh, but just a wonderful voice now. And then it turned out that he also did uh, audiobooks. And what uh, what I asked him to do, and he accommodated along with another uh, wonderful uh, voice talent, Jennifer Knighton, we do a uh, quote-unquote full cast. I, I asked them to do uh, males, Graydon male reading the male voices, and Jennifer reading the female voices. And I always just thought that it read much true, uh, more true, to have the actual genders assigned that way. And, uh, for instance, uh, Dell's story has a female uh, protagonist, and so we're having a uh, female read the story. And it just seems much more natural to me when you're listening. And the audiobook process is very fascinating because the stories really do come alive in different ways uh, than when you're reading them on the page and when you're hearing them in the ear. You can really enjoy them uh, on a different level. And I... I by the time we go to print and by the time the book's in your hand, I've probably read each story more than the writer who wrote it. And so for me to then listen to the audio and hear something new in the story that I've read 40 times already is just really kind of fascinating and wonderful process. Eric, I want to stay with you now. We've only got uh, a little over seven minutes left, but I want to get to all three of you on this. Now, you're all completely immersed in the horror genre, and you know what scares you when you're writing. Eric, what scares you the most in real life? Uh, other than spiders, um, you know, I, I'm fond of saying uh, when people ask, it's an inevitable question that comes up, you know, what's the scariest movie ever made? What's the greatest horror movie? And we all, of course, have our genre favorites. Uh, but I always go back to uh, Kramer versus Kramer, which is probably the oddest choice for a horror movie ever. But my feeling on that is, Something, whether it's a monster or a whether it's a monster or a judge and a lawyer, something is taking your children away. Something is taking your, breaking your family up, and I, I think that's what it really comes down to: is all of the things that we hold near and dear, here, whether it is your kids, your pet, your wife, your husband, your best friend, your brother. That loss, uh, that something, whatever that is, an ice storm or a psychotic killer or an alien, something is taking a family away. A friend away or something from you. And it's the best stories, I think, uh, Howells touches on that, um, Dell touches on that, as do most of the stories in 18 Wheels of Horror, and I think other great works from other great writers, they really do uh, focus on loss. And that's to me, that's one of the most horrifying things is losing something. I'm going to ask the same question to Dell. Dell, what scares you the most in real life? I think... Um probably the fact that we don't know anybody. We don't know the workings of their mind. We don't know their real thoughts. We don't know behind closed doors. And I think we get into a comfort place with people and think we do. Uh, and uh, that that film is, is such a piece of tissue that can tear or snap at any point. And I think that is probably the thing that bothers me the most. That's very honest. Thank you for that, Dell. Hal, what scares you the most in real life? Oh, God, with, with me, it's easy. Um, I was uh, a widower at uh, 42 or 43 years old. I lost oh, my first so husband to that. Oh, uh, freaks. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, but I lost my first husband to a very, very freak illness. And... Um, 
as Dell said, I think loss is, I mean, I'm married to a great guy, guy now. And like I said, he's half my age, super everything. But, you know, just the thought, you know, and, and it's interesting because cause that's what horror is in its, in, its, in its rawest form is, you know, he goes out to the, the grocery store to pick up a gallon of milk. Is he coming back? You know, be, especially when you've had the experience where they didn't come back. Um, and I think that above everything else, that terrifies me. I'm comfortable with monsters. Monsters don't bother me. I live with monsters every day. Um, but the feeling that the person, you know, the other half of your life isn't going to be there um, and can be taken from you, I think that's the thing that terrifies me more than anything else. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, I, I do a paranormal show with a lot of people that come on that are ghost hunters and UFO people and, and things of that nature. But the scariest shows for me are the serial killer shows because those guys are real mm, and they're yeah. diabolical. They're just pure yeah. evil. Eric, is there going to be an 18 Wheels of Horror Part 2? Well, the plan is, well, I sincerely hope so. The plan is to do a series of books. I want to branch out into the genres. Uh, hopefully 18 Wheels of Science Fiction and uh, 18 Wheels of Action. Uh, and let's even, let's, let's go for the juggler here, 18 Wheels of Romance. Uh, that's kind of the idea, again, keeping with the theme of doing books and stories uh, for truckers. Um, and I have to say, at the same time, it's not just for truckers. These stories are very accessible to anyone else. You don't. Uh, we were talking about level of detail earlier. You don't have to know uh, that a Peterbilt has a 16-speed gear shift uh, and how to and how to shift it in order to enjoy the stories. They're about characters, people, monsters, uh, fun events, and anyone who loved Smokey and the Bandit or Maximum Overdrive or any of the trucking stories or songs throughout the years can like these stories. And so again, uh, I'd love to do uh, 18 Wheels of Four or Two. Uh, I think the next one, again, is going to branch into another genre, and then uh, and we'll go from there. Dale Howison, Hal Bachner, and Eric Miller have been our guests tonight, folks. Uh, www.nightfrightshow.com. You're going to see a book cover there, 18 Wheels of Horror. Click on it. Get Do yourself a favor this fall. Get this book. You're going to enjoy it. And the uh, the audio book will be out shortly, folks, as Eric has just told us. I want to thank all three of you for coming on. It's just been a riveting show. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Brent Holland from Night Fright. We'll see you all next time. Inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza. First person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com.